today to introduce Tammy Sugarman. Um, Tammy is the Associate Dean for Collections at Georgia State University Library in Atlanta, Georgia, where she oversees cataloging, acquisitions, collection development, and the institutional repository. She is active in um, the Alex Acquisition Section of ALA and is co-chair of the Collection Development Committee of the Association of Southeastern Research Libraries. Uh, Tammy holds an MS in Information from the University of Michigan, an MA in History from the Citadel, and a BA in History from Boston University. So let's give Tammy a warm welcome. Thank you. We won't be picking a winner, 
Rather, we'll examine various IR implementation flavors to see good examples of the creativity that exists in academic IRs today. So as a cupcake course, we'll begin with some background on our theme. Institutional repositories have been around for approximately 10 years, having emerged in 2002 with the development of DSpace by MIT, and the subsequent release of DSpace software in 2003 under an open source arrangement. Clifford Lynch, Executive Director of the Coalition for Networked Information, posits that the following technology trends and developments came together at this time which facilitated the creation and proliferation of IRs across academic institutions. So in 2003, we had a decrease in storage costs, development of standards such as the Open Archives Metadata Harvesting Protocol, recognition of the need for digital preservation, and development of free, publicly accessible journal article collections in disciplines such as high energy physics, such as archive, that demonstrated a new, non-traditional way of disseminating and accessing scholarly information. Lynch goes on to say that the IR, quote, is most essentially an organizational commitment to the stewardship of these digital materials. This includes the preservation of materials, the organization of materials, and the access and distribution of these materials. The intellectual life and scholarship of our institutions will be represented in the IR, documented and shared in digital form. The IR, quote, is a new channel for structuring the university's contribution to the broader world. Many institutions and libraries have embraced this role of capturing, distributing, and preserving the unique content of the institution through the establishment of an IR. This map shows the locations of IRs as of January 2012. And as you would expect, most are concentrated in Europe and North America. Although DSpace is the most commonly used software for IRs, today there are options other than using DSpace to create and manage the IR. And this is a screenshot of MIT's uh, DSpace installation for their IR in 2006. So you can see it's pretty basic and primitive at this point. Um, but you'll see later, I'll show you another slide of their um, implementation today. The basic structure has remained the same. So they still have the various communities or subject areas where they put the collections. And this is a screenshot that I took um, two weeks ago, so 2012 of their implementation. So you can see that they've done a little sprucing up of the site and they have a RSS feed for their news, but the basic structure is still the same. Another open source repository software is Fedora, which was developed at Cornell. And this is an example of a Fedora IR at Columbia. And again, you can still see they have the content arranged by the departments and subjects. Now there are also hosting solutions available. And some of these, such as Open Repository, which is a Biomed Central, um, now Springer, um, soft, they use the DSpace software to host the institution's IR. So it's hosted on the um, Biomed Central servers. And the hosting provides the institution um, upgrades to the software and programming changes required for interface customizations. So we all know that open source does not mean free. So um, some libraries now are at the point where they um, need the hosted solution, so it's someone else to manage the programming and the upgrades, and so Wireland Central does that. But you can still see it basically still has the same uh, DSpace looking feel. Digital Commons from, from vPress is also a hosted solution, but they use their own proprietary software. Customizations are made by Digital Commons, so the library does not need to do any programming or graphic design. The information resides outside, on servers outside the institution, and vPress provides all technical support and backup for archival purposes. So they build it, customize it, and host it. And this is an example of Georgia State's IR and vPress implementation. Um, and so we um, 
chose the pictures. This is a rolling slideshow. Um, a rolling slideshow, and then we decided how to group our research and scholarship. So we have by school and college and department and various other things. But you can see the B press is a little more sophisticated than the D space. Now, in addition to an individual institutional approach, there are a few examples of consortia IRs. Um, this is an example of the Georgia Statewide Institutional Repository. It's called Galileo Knowledge Repository. Um, we have 36 schools in the University System of Georgia, and Georgia Tech put in a grant to the IMLS, and they were awarded uh, the funds in 2009 to do this project. So it involves building a meta searching site that connects scholarly content across the system. So Georgia Tech is using DSpace, and they've done two separate things. They're actually hosting repositories for four schools, and then they created a meta searching site for other schools in the state that already had an IR. So for example, Georgia State already had an IR in place, and so our material feeds into this Georgia Knowledge Repository. Now for the hosted institutions, they established other IR-related services such as copyright research, digitization, content submission, and preservation. Okay, so now that we've established our theme, let's take a look at some ingredients that when baked into our recipe will contribute to its overall flavor. In other words, what materials go into an IR? As Clifford Lynch said, it's the intellectual life and scholarship of our institutions. There's a body of literature that discusses the failure of the if you build it, they will come model in reference to IRs. That is, libraries found that once they had the IR available to an institution, faculty were slow to embrace it and contribute their materials. In order to begin populating the IR, libraries took the quote, low hanging fruit which were materials librarians could easily obtain and submit to the repository. This explains why EPDs and scholarly articles are the most common ingredients in the IR. And I think my bracket is a little bit off, so it should be the ETDs and scholarly articles that are the most common. Um, for example, at Georgia State, students were already submitting their theses and dissertations electronically, and they were housed on the library server. So when we got our IR, we were able to migrate these into the IR without student or faculty intervention, and that gave us um, about 1,000 items right away into the IR. Scholarly articles have also been commonly added, and this may be because many libraries sold the idea of the IR on the premise that the IR would play a key role in reforming the system of scholarly communication by expanding access to research and reasserting control over scholarship. And in addition, many faculty were already familiar with subject repositories, as I mentioned, Archive, which is a faculty-driven self-archive initiative for articles in physics. So they were already familiar with putting preprints and scholarly articles, and so um, those are the two, two biggest collections in most IRS today. As more scholarship is produced digitally, and the cultural and intellectual resources of institutions are digitized, institutional repositories are seeing an ever-expanding source of content. And as IR software and capabilities have matured, libraries have expanded the content of the IR beyond ETDs and articles to reflect their institution's intellectual output in other areas. Newer ingredients in the IR include journals produced at the institution. For example, the Undergraduate Research Journal is gaining a lot of popularity in academic IRs. This is an example of the Colonial Academic Alliance Undergraduate Research Journal, um, which is edited by someone at Georgia State. The Colonial Academic Alliance is the academic arm of the Colonial Athletic Alliance, of which GSU is a member. I don't know if other athletic alliances have like an academic arm, but this is, was sort of a renegade collection of schools that we were a member of. And so they developed this undergraduate research journal. The journal is peer-reviewed, it accepts
concepts, individual and collaborative research reports formerly written by the undergraduate students while enrolled as an undergraduate at one of these schools. Any undergraduate may submit work to the journal, and to be eligible for publication, the research must be faculty mentored. Submitters to the journal must own copyright to the work being submitted. And the interesting thing is, in addition to faculty reviewers, the journal enlists student reviewers, so they gain experience with peer review and scholarly publishing process. If I take a look. So this is actually in the Georgia State Institutional Repository. Um, and so this is a current volume. There's only been two issues. So we have volume one and volume two. Um, and you'll see it. They have a nice journal home. They have got the journal. And they have a whole editorial board. So there's a representative from each of the member schools on the editorial board. They have their policies and how to submit. And then, actually, the article gives you a nice abstract. Your recommended citation, and then you can actually download the article. So it's a PDF. The nice thing about the ePress software, um, ePress started out as a publishing company, so they have a robust back end to this which allows you to do the submissions and the peer review and sending out notices for resubmission or revisions, all taken care of, and then the actual article is posted. And the other nice thing is that ePress generates emails to the student whenever someone downloads their paper. So they get a monthly report saying you had X number of downloads of your paper, and the students love that. Actually, faculty like that too. Another type of content going into IRs is material produced at or from the conference. Some institutions go further and capture the conference itself in the IR with video recording schedules of the presentations and the presentations themselves. This is an example from the Georgia Tech Institutional Repository. I'll let you guess. Do you know what? This is why I told you about what software they're using. This one. Yeah. <laughs> so you can tell. And this one I thought was interesting. They've done, Georgia Tech has done a really good job of not only getting materials into the repository, but going out to faculty and saying, we will do this for you. So they have a real service model, and they say, we will video your conference, and we'll get the permissions from the people speaking, and we'll get their papers, and we'll put them all in here. Um, and so this is an example of the submissions, and then they actually have the recordings, which I won't bring up. So they have streaming or you can download the video. So that's nice. So we could have put this conference in an institutional repository. And, and then it's archived and we have it. This is 
one more example of a conference from the University of Tennessee. And this is using the Press software. The, um, the back end of Press manages the journals, also has a conference portion, and so that will also manage the submission of papers to the conference, the peer review, and then the actual final And I like this one because they actually showed the whole conference program. So you can tell what the schedule was. And then you can, I mean, they put this up before the conference, so this can actually be your conference program online. And then they put in the actual papers. And in this case, they actually have the recording also. So it's right in the middle. And then Only in 2007, but if they had additional conferences, then you could have like a whole list for each year. Okay. Um, another special ingredient that can be added to our IR cupcake are book galleries. Um, Georgia State Library hosts an annual faculty author event to celebrate faculty who have published in the past year. In 2011, we honored faculty who have published a monograph. So we captured the bibliographic information into the IR, and we have a slideshow running during the event. And then this is collected and it stays in the repository. So this is all done by the software. This is in, we had to put the images in, but it creates the slideshow for you. This is the list of the books. And then, and so we had this scrolling during the event. And we also get this really good opportunity to push the IR. So on each table, we had iPads, and we had the, this scrolling through, and then we also showed back how they could add other materials to the IR. So they really went done. And then we'll play that again for 2012. So we'll have that in there. Okay. So we're up to the bakers. Um, we looked at some of the ingredients, so let's see who the bakers are. Who are the people who have put together the ingredients to bake the cupcake, or in our case, create and sustain the institutional repository? The title of this presentation indicated that technical services are key in the recipe for a successful IR, and I believe they are. So let's look at how technical services can contribute to the success of the IR. And we know that the bakers and people in the library don't work alone, so these are the other people that contribute to the IR. We're going to talk about technical services. So let's look at catalogers. Traditionally, cataloging has been responsible for organizing and describing material in order to facilitate discovery. This fits right in with the IR because content is the prime concern. Utilizing cataloging expertise and experience in establishing the proper metadata to populate any digital repository is vital in enabling more efficient use of the data by researchers. Catalogers can contribute to the success of the IR by one, generating metadata. Whether the content is self-archived, library collected, or transferred automatically between information systems, staff with a background in metadata should review submitted items and augment the metadata supply for better discovery and access by users. They can also contribute to quality control. There should be a review of the metadata of self-submitted content for correct word spellings and titles at the least. They can select appropriate keywords from applicable thesaurus terms, and they can consult with submitters about what thesauri and metadata schema are most appropriate. And then, in some cases, they can create metadata and input material into the IR on behalf of the submitter. Um, this is an example. These are our thesis and dissertations in our IR. Um, we use catalogers to help with guidelines for the IR. In 
including schema elements, date formatting, and date here, and to help us establish what elements we want to require versus optional. And this is an example of why quality control is important. I think I'm just preaching to a choir here, but um, our students self-submit their pieces and dissertations. And so, of course, as librarians, we have lots of directions and guidelines for them to put it in. But we tell them how to format the title, to format, format it in a sentence case. But as you can see here, if you can see it, um, some are in all caps, and some are correctly in sentence case. So we have to go back and show consistency with titles and other information and change the metadata to conform as necessary. In 2008, Connell and Sedminsky from Ohio State University sent out a survey to ARL libraries. The survey describes specific tasks or activities related to the management of an IR, and respondents were asked to indicate which of these activities were performed in technical services. They had a 21% response rate, which I don't think is bad for ARL. Uh, more than half of the institutions reported that most of the tasks relating to metadata were performed in technical services. And you can see from this chart, if you can see that sure how clear it is, but 90% reported that defining descriptive metadata standards took place in technical services. So descriptive metadata is the information that you use to search and locate an object, such as the title or the subject, keywords, or publisher. The task of assigning metadata was the second most frequent task performed, and 30% of the institutions indicated that determining digitization standards Preservation operations and batch loading were also done in technical services. So you can see um, the other ones that they had. They do quality control, setting up presentation of content. Some actually submit the content. Another technical service role is creating and managing metadata crosswalks to map metadata into the IR. A common workflow is to create marked metadata for library catalogs by repurposing non-marked metadata. Most libraries have focused on repurposing non-marked metadata for electronic theses and dissertations. And we do this at Georgia State. So we take it out of the IR and put it into the catalog. The University of Iowa has a process to repurpose non-marked ProQuest metadata for batch loading ETDs into their institutional repository. Uh, another example is an Ohio State project transforms mark records found in the Ohio State University's library catalog into double core records for digital resources batch loaded into their IR. The authors state that the processes they described could be applied to creating metadata for theses, dissertations, and other catalog materials that are digitized and added to an institutional repository, such as conference proceedings, exhibition catalogs, and technology. So these are sort of the cross you know, between the IR and the catalog, or vice versa, or between another system and the IR. So these are all ways that people are trying not to recreate data over and over again, copying it from one system to another, trying to maximize effort and uh, get it from one system to another. Now, while some of these projects usually require programming, for example, Perl scripts, the technical services library can and should at least be involved in examining descriptive metadata in the exporting system and determining optional and required elements for the best presentation of the metadata in the new system. Other technical services personnel, such as electronic resources librarians, can also contribute to the IR. They have expertise in licensing, and understanding what is and is not permitted in licenses. And they have relationships with library vendors should contact and or negotiation with publishers be required. And in some cases, um, if faculty want to put in an article that they don't have rights to, there's some um, investigation into what exactly, what copyright rights they have, that they can put it in, and sometimes negotiation with the publisher is necessary. Um, we had an example, our e-resources person had a good contact with the publisher and was able to you know, get the information that we needed quickly instead of sending an email to a blanket, hey, and I have permission to do X. So a lot of times those people have 
important information that can help you speed along the process of getting materials into the IOM. Also in technical services, serials librarians. They are in a perfect position to facilitate the setup of new journals in an IR. They can help faculty understand the nature of serials, for example, how and why to assign an ISSN, and the numbering format of serials issues. And I don't have to go into this because Regina went into it this morning. Um, so, you know, we had faculty, um, we had our honors college come to us about three weeks ago, and they want to start a journal in the college journal for honor students, so um, they want to showcase the work of the honor students and, and get more of the students to, to join the honors college. Um, so they um, didn't think about the title, they didn't think about how they're going to number it, they don't think about any of those issues. Um, so serials librarians are the ones that keep up with all this information. So um, this is an example of before we put together, before we let anyone start a journal in the repository. And our serials librarian helped us set up this form. So it just asks questions of how are you going to number the journal and how are you going to name it, um, and then the description of the journal, the aims of the scope, the editorial board. So it's great to have somebody that understands those issues and is keeping up with them to make sure, I mean, the point is that you want your journal to be discoverable and easily accessible by people that, that want to see it. So they can play a very important role. So although most of the literature about making the success of the IR focuses on the importance of public services librarians and his or her outreach to faculty, which is very important, there are important roles that technical services can play to ensure the success of the IR. As in baking a cupcake, some ingredients are required in order for the cake to bake. So they tell me because I don't really bake. Um, <laughs> baking soda, sugar, flour. Some are optional depending on the flavor of the cupcake. I would argue that technical services falls into the required elements, required ingredients, critical for success, not working alone, but alongside key personnel in other areas of the life. So how have libraries reorganized to accommodate these new efforts? And this depends on a large extent on the type of IR implemented whether it's an open source solution managed by the library itself or a hosted solution. So of course, if you're going to do the open source where you're managing all the programming and the upgrades and the technical aspects on the back end, you will have a much different organizational structure than in some of the hosted solution. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, in the 2008 AOL survey that I mentioned, most institutions indicated that the operation and management of the IR is distributed among multiple units of the library, but most also reported heavy technical services involvement, and that the new duties in technical services replaced former responsibilities. The most frequently replaced responsibilities were traditional AACR2 mark cataloging, ordering, and receiving materials. In the case of cataloging, the respondents indicated that either other personnel had absorbed the load, or that the institution was outsourcing cataloging or some indicated that less ordering and receiving is taking place, bringing up staff and acquisitions and cataloging. New positions added to technical services units were metadata librarians. Is that happening in anybody's library? Adding metadata librarian positions? Or downsizing cataloging? No, okay. <laughs> well, it happened in my library, so maybe. Um, I did a scan of recent job postings in the Chronicle of Higher Education, and I turned up these position titles for librarians with metadata and cataloging experience. So they all have different titles. But I'll show you on this slide, these are some of the stated requirements and preferences for posted positions, for those posted positions that I just listed. So to me, this shows that traditional cataloging tasks and practices are still highly relevant. Catalog knowledge is being integrated into job descriptions for current and future development and maintenance of digital data. The job advertisement showed that many of these positions include requirements involving some standard cataloging functions of a professional cataloger along with new responsibilities such as e resources management, creating and maintaining digital repositories. Um, so, there, this just, to me, this just shows you that things are shifting. Um, the advertisements now for the metadata library 
librarians as well as for scholarly communication librarians and for IR librarians all mention metadata in some way. I believe that our changing environment offer opportunities for technical services librarians to experience personal and professional growth. Opportunities to be innovative, influence policy, and ultimately affect change if they collaborate and serve as consultants to help other departments manage digitized collections, including the IR. The cupcake bakers who land on cupcake wars show a lot of flexibility and creativity. If you ever watch the show, there is inevitably some type of cupcake crisis. So there's too much of one ingredient, the cupcake doesn't bake, um, and almost always, baker unfamiliarity with the ingredients, so they have to do it on the fly. And sometimes it's discord with the baker's assistants or helpers. So the baker that triumphs is the one that is not afraid to try something new, shows flexibility, and sometimes this involves throwing out the cupcake and starting over, and works well with his or her teammates to meet the final goal. And I was impressed when Dean Coleman said this morning that MSU works as a team, so they have Rarely does someone do something by themselves and they have the support of others. And I think that's especially important for this kind of initiative because it really goes across the library. At the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that one of the reasons I'm fascinated by reality cooking shows is the creativity shown by the contestants. So as I wind up the presentation, I thought we'd take a look at a few IRs that I think show creativity. They mix ingredients or materials, they invent new flavors, and are overall appealing and valuable to those who use them. So I'll just, we'll just look at three. This is from Illinois Wesleyan University. And this is a book gallery, so it's sort of similar to what we did at Georgia State. But the reason I like this is that it shows original scholarship by students it's visually appealing and it preserves the book format. So it's not just a citation, but it's actually got a whole book in here. So this was a senior exhibition catalog. And then you can download the entire thing. University of Maryland Law School. So although this is not visually attractive, the reason I think this is created, it showcases the unique contributions of the institution's faculty. So they're a law school. This is unique to Maryland. They say um, the expertise of the faculty of the University of Maryland School of Law has often been recognized by Congress and the contributions of UM law professors to the legislative process via congressional testimony and submitted documentation are gathered in this collection. So they are taking expertise of their faculty, this is unique to their school, and showcasing it here. So um, this is a good example of how you need to focus your IR on what your institution is doing. So not everyone is going to showcase the same difference. And this is the actual testimony, and it's very good for researchers seeking primary documents, particular to current legal activity.
Uh, this is from Cornell. Can you guess what type of software this is? No. You would think because I developed it, but this is actually deep space. No. But they're using. Um, but they, they kind of pretty know a little bit. Um, so this one I thought was unique um, because this showcases their archives. And so and this is hard to see. This is the university archives, and it says it's a centralized, searchable access for institutional digital resources maintained by Cornell University archives. And so they have information on some of the presidents. And I thought this section was interesting, this division of university communications. This is how you tell it's these ways because they have they all have this issue. So they have a collection of the Cornell Chronicle, which they digitized back to 1969. And which I thought was interesting, they have the faculty minutes online collection back to 1868. So they've digitized all this information with 2,090 meetings during the past 140 years, which contains 16,000 pages. They said the scope of the faculty's attention is very widely over the years. I would imagine that's true. Um, and so this reflects the changing customs and interests of the faculty. The compilation is a rich snapshot of Cornell University's history, and hopefully will be utilized as a resource by university historians. This resource is also useful as background in the ongoing process of governance. So again, this is unique to Cornell, um, so showcasing what, what's in their university archives. I think this is a great example for alumni and for donors. Some of them will get very excited about seeing the archives digitized and up here. You know, Georgia State next year, we're celebrating our 100th anniversary, and I don't think we'll have any changes up there, but I think that would be another great um, it would be great to show because that we actually do have it. Okay, so the winners in our cupcake wars, to sum up, they're flexible bakers who well, work well with the systems. They try new flavors, they aren't afraid to take a chance. And they make sure they reflect the theme, which is the strategic vision of their particular institution. I also have a bibliography. And I should mention, um, this is in the Georgia State Institutional Repository. Mm -hmm. So the first slide has the link on there. Um, and you can actually download the slides from the repository. So those are in there. And I'm happy to take any questions. And if you'd like me to show you anything else, I'm also happy to. Yes. Did you turn up any reasons that the institutional repositories have not gotten a lot of traction? Um, just in, in the yeah. like you did some research for this. Right. Uh, the main reasons that people say is that you have to provide it as a service. So you can't expect faculty or anybody else to actually submit their own materials to the repository. So at Georgia State, we found we go out to the faculty and we say, can I have an updated CV? Or we find our updated CV on the website. And we go through and we see, you know, we start with articles and we see what they've done. We do a little research and see which ones we're able to put in the repository. We put a few in, you know, we send them an email saying we'd like to put these in, this is what it looks like. And for B Press, as soon as they get that first email saying, your article has been downloaded X number of times. And B Press gives you a nice little dashboard. It actually shows you what people are searching in Google to find. If they went through Google to find your article, so they show you the keywords. Um, but once faculty get that, then they're more interested in actually having the materials in there. But again, they won't put their own materials in there. Um, I think it just, and it's also, I think, the way that you market it. So um, we're a state institution, so one way that we've had success marketing it is that we have to show to our state legislators what we're doing. So we always get questions. Be sure our state institutions get this done. You're paying your professors all this money, you're doing this inconsequential or research that is not meaningful, or we don't know what they're doing. And so that's one thing that we just said. This is one place that you can go when you're up there on the hill, and you can point and say, these are all the things that we did in all these different areas. This is what our students have produced. 
is one of the faculty that introduced this year. We did this conference at the university. So that's one way that we've also gained some traction. But I think it's it's difficult to find in your own institution what's going to make the difference and what's what's going to appeal to, to faculty. Market as a service rather than here's one more thing you have to do. Any questions about cupcake boards? <laughs> <laughs> That's all you're going to remember about this presentation. <laughs> Thank you. 